glasses on. There we go. Um, first off, I'd like to say good morning to everyone, and um, just thank you for the um, prayers that you guys said today, uh, this week, um, for my friend Brad and his wife Jill. Um, I know we were praying for miraculous healing and restoration of his mind, but on Friday at uh, 1 o'clock, he passed away. Um, I do thank you for the prayers of peace, because when I went on Thursday to visit him, there was a distinct manifestation of peace in the room around Brad and around his family. Uh, I thank you for that. This last week has been filled with ups and downs. And uh, refining my message today uh, has been a struggle at times. And I thank you that this is a place of, of uh, mercy and graciousness. I thank you that I can call you guys family. And that through the thick and thin... You will hear me and love me and have patience with me. Um, Brad uh, left his wife of 34 years. And in this world, uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find better people than Brad and Jill. They're examples of uh, never being anxious for anything. Um, always enjoying the fullness of life, making friends wherever they went, no matter, even if it was just for an evening, the time that they spent with you, you became their friend, and it was genuine. And um, it will, Brad will be missed. <sighs> so, now that I got that out of my way, thank you. Um, today, well, <laughs> Matt said that he would take over for me um, and, and, and preach this message, but um, I know Brad would want me to continue on and preach, um, because for Brad, if you give your word, it's a commitment, it's something you need to stick to, so I'm muddling through this today. I say thank you. Um, today we find ourselves in chapter 7 of uh, Mark's gospel and chapter 7 is not quite halfway through the gospel but it's far enough that there's lots of changes happening to the disciples to the Pharisees and the scribes and to the people that Jesus has encountered along the way chapter 7 we'll see four different types of people um, religious leaders the disciples um, Gentiles who live amongst the Jewish people and most likely Gentiles who have had very little to no exposure to the Jewish people. And these four types of, of, of people are revealed to us four conditions of the heart. And um, we're going to examine those and while we do I, I say let's examine ourselves. Let's take a look at our heart condition in a way that uh, is not condemning, because Jesus is not a condemning um, lover of our souls, but he's a refiner of our souls. Um, so we're going to just open up in prayer. Father, we come to you today with grateful hearts for being part of this body of believers um, who've been called together to worship you, to love you, to celebrate life with you and with each other. We ask today, Lord, that you'd open our eyes to see your hand moving amongst our midst and in the world around us as we go out. We ask that you would open our ears to hear your words, your truth, because, Lord, your word is truth, and that truth refines us and transforms us, and we welcome it. And Father, we also ask that you would open our hearts to feel your presence, that the Holy Spirit would have his way within us to make those changes that you desire so that we may be transformed into the image of Christ Jesus as it is your will for our lives. 
Lord, we love you and we thank you for this word and for what you will do with this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before we get into the meat of chapter 7, um, I believe that we have to look at not just verses one by one or chapters one by one, but the Bible as a whole. Because from beginning to the end, the Bible is one story with many chapters. And that story is about the creator God who made us all. We are his creation, so we are included in this story. But the story is about God and who God wants us to be and how God wants life to be lived. And so we have to always keep into account and remembrance of um, what we've read before and what we've read. So if you only read certain parts of the Bible, you're never going to get the whole picture of who God is and what he wants to do. So I'd, I'd say read the Bible from start to finish, from cover to cover. Read it once, read it twice. Um, that way the Holy Spirit can bring back to your memory things that you've read. If you've never read it, the, the Spirit can't minister it to you. So, with that in mind, I'm going to do a, a real quick run-through of where we've been so far. In chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel, we see John the Baptist on the scene. He's out in the wilderness baptizing people, calling them to the repentance of sins. And when he baptizes them, it's to cleanse their heart, a washing away of their sins so they can receive what God has to offer. To, to offer them. And John proclaims that there's another one greater than he who is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now people are coming out to see John and experiencing God's presence and God's provision and then they go back to their lives. They go back to the cities, the towns, their villages, their families and they tell what they've experienced and encountered and they go out to see John. And this is a power of a testimony and our testimonies are very important. And we'll see testimony after testimony after testimony through the chapters of, of the Gospels. From there, Jesus goes to John. He gets baptized. The heavens open. And he hears, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. John hears this. And most likely Andrew, Peter's brother, and John, the son of Zebedee, heard it because they're disciples of John. And this is an important thing, but we, we won't spend time there. From there, Jesus goes to the synagogue, and he preaches and teaches the kingdom of God to them in such a way that they say he, he does it with authority, not like the scribes or the Pharisees. There's excitement about Jesus' presence, and we know there's excitement because the Pharisees and the scribes, the priests, do not question Jesus, but they receive what he has to offer. And he speaks with such authority and power that a demon comes out, and it's the first miracle in Mark's gospel. From there, he goes to Peter's house, and he heals his mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law, and she gets up and serves them, and the testimony goes out. People are talking about what Jesus is doing. It's testimony, experiencing God, sharing that in their lives, testimony, and so much so that the whole town comes to the house, and Jesus is healing people and casting out demons, and at the end of chapter one, he heals the leper, and he tells the leper to go and to offer the, the sacrifice that Moses commanded to the priest as a testimony to them. So our testimony and their testimony is very important, and we'll see this throughout all the chapters. Chapter 2, I'm going to speed up here because I could dwell a long time on this. Um, chapter 2, Jesus continues to, to minister and to heal people and to cast out demons. Um, uh, the man is, is lowered through the roof, and Jesus says to him, son, your, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees now are questioning Jesus. They're like, who are you to forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus says to them, so that you may know that I have the power to forgive sins, stand up, take your mat, and go. And he heals the, the, the paralytic, and he gets up and leaves. And this is a testimony that everyone sees and shares. And there's a buzz and excitement about Jesus. Now, from there, he goes and he calls Levi, and he goes and has dinner with Levi and the sinners, and the scribes and the Pharisees are there, and they're like, why are you having dinner with him? <clears throat> and this is all important. And, and he says, I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinner. The healthy doesn't need the physician, the sick do. And this is, is puzzling to the scribes and the Pharisees because they are the religious leaders. They are righteous in their own eyes. They are um, the example to be followed. And here this, this man, Jesus, is coming, and he's not following them. He's not with them. He's not 
uh, spending time with him, he's, he's with the sinners. And so they go and they report that back to the temple. Now in this chapter, we see the forgiveness of sins. We see healing. And in chapter 3, it moves on. And now the Pharisees have got a new look on Jesus. They're looking to accuse Jesus of wrongdoing for not following them, their teaching, or their ways. It says in there that their hearts were hardened toward God and toward God's power. They're seeking out ways to destroy Jesus, now the Pharisees. And these are the people that were supposed to be revealing God to the world. We'll get into that. And in chapter 3, we see healings, demons cast out. Um, the demons acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. And all the people around hear this. And they share this. It's testimony after testimony they share. And how do we know this? Because more and more people are coming to see Jesus, meet Jesus, encounter Jesus. And then in chapter 3, Jesus calls the 12 to him because he wants them to be with him, to spend time, to learn, because he's going to send them out. And these are unqualified, unskilled men, unknowledgeable men, if you will, in the ways of the Levites. And in chapter 3, there's a change in Jesus' teaching. He now starts teaching in parables to the Pharisees and the scribes, because if they truly know God, know God's ways, they'd be able to figure it out. But he preaches and teaches plainly to the disciples because they don't know. Chapter 4 goes on where now large crowds are coming to see Jesus and he's teaching them in parables because the scribes and Pharisees are with them. And he teaches about the kingdom of God, the seed, the sower, the mustard seed. But privately, when he gets the disciples alone, he's teaching them plainly so they'll understand and why does he do this? Because he wants them to understand. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that the disciples taught in parables. So when they went out and preached and teach, they taught plainly. And that's important to remember. All this builds up into where we're going to be in chapter 7. So please stick with me. Um, chapter 4, if we recall, we have the, the, the storm and the boat being overtaken, and Jesus says, Where, why are you of little faith? You know, they see Jesus commanding the, the wind and the water. Now he has power over nature. So he's cast out demons, he's healed people, he's forgiven sins, he's got power over the wind and sea. Truly, he is the Son of God. They've heard that from the demons that have been cast out. Chapter 5 is a chapter about displays of power. He gets to the, um, the Gerasenes, and there's a demon-possessed man. Not just one demon, but many demons. And he casts that man out. Now, this man is most likely a Gentile because of where he lives in that region of the Decapolis. Very important. He's most likely a Gentile or non-Jew. And he casts out many demons and the, into the, the swine. The swine run down. The people watching the swine see this, and they go and report this back to their town. The people of the town come out and ask Jesus to leave. They don't want him there. But the man who's delivered says, Lord, may I go with you? And he says, no, go back to your own people. Doesn't tell him to go to the temple and offer like he did in chapter 1. He says, go back to your people and tell them. So most likely, he is a non-practicing Jew or a Gentile flat out, and he's telling the people in the region of the Decapolis, the ten Greek cities. Very important to see what's, where we're going with this. From there, there comes the woman who's got a flow of blood, and she says in her heart, if I could only touch Jesus, I'd be healed. How did she get that? She heard the stories, the testimonies of people being healed by Jesus, being delivered, being touched, um, being restored, and she reaches out and touches him. Again, he doesn't condemn her for that. He says, your faith has made you well. At the same time that this happens, he is going to Jairus, a, a ruler of the synagogue, a leader of the synagogue, to, to heal his daughter, who turns out to be dead. But now, remember, Jairus is part of the synagogue, who in chapter 3 was seeking ways to destroy Jesus, to condemn him. But in his time of need, he reaches out, he's like, I gotta go see him. And so now the disciples see something new, raising of the dead, power that Jesus has in this world. Chapter 6, we see the hardness of hearts. Jesus returns to his own town, and he cannot do many mighty miracles there because they say, this Jesus, we know, he's the carpenter's son. Their hearts are hardened. They've heard the testimonies of how he's done great and miraculous things, but when he is in their presence, they're like, eh, we know who he is. Yeah, 
can't be. And so he sends out the 12. Now he sends out the 12 disciples and he empowers them to preach and teach. And whether they're preaching and teaching, they're preaching and teaching the kingdom of God. They preach and teach plainly because that's what he's taught them. And they have such authority in their word that they themselves cast out demons and heal the sick and have great success in what they're doing. Important to remember. These men have worked in the power of God. And after they come back, we see the, fighting, the, the feeding of the 5,000. People are still flocking to Jesus because they've witnessed and experienced the power from the disciples and the stories that other people have told, the testimonies. And here's another miraculous miracle. Jesus creates food from the, the, from the fish and the loaves to feed the five, ten thousand plus people. It's something new, a new power of God that they have seen. Those that are with Jesus. And it doesn't end there in chapter 6, because in chapter 6, Jesus sees the men struggling on the boat against the wind and the waves. And Jesus now walks on water. And they think it's a ghost. Because he's defying the laws of physics, he's walking on water. Another new miracle, another new revelation of the power of God to these men. And it's interesting that in this chapter it says that we are are told that the disciples hardened their hearts. And we'll get to that here in chapter 7. And lastly, chapter 6 ends with the testimonies of people knowing the power of Jesus And this is probably most likely the testimony from the woman who touched Jesus and was healed of her blood flow, that now people are being laid on mats out in the street, and they say, if only I can touch the hem of his cloak, I will be healed. So they're taking that testimony of touching Jesus and being healed to, if I could just touch his garment, I will be healed. The power of a testimony. It fuels the story of Jesus and the disciples, and it should be fueled to us as well. And now we get to chapter 7. Chapter 7 can be broken into uh, four heart conditions or five parts, and we're going to read through these and then talk about them a little bit at a time. The first section is the heart that's opposed to God. Mark 7, chapter 1. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all of the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And Jesus said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. So, here we see an interaction between the Pharisees and Jesus. The purpose of their question, they came from Jerusalem to seek an accusation. Again, back to chapter 3, they're looking for ways to accuse him, to condemn him, to persecute him, to destroy him. This is their intention. And in this time and in this era, the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders, they have power. They have power socially over the people. Because in verse 3 here it says, and all of the Jews. And it's important that they call that out. Because these are the people who, who were born to the, to the nation of Israel. They're, they're Jewish by birth. They're observers of the law. But who's making this law? But the scribes and the Pharisees. And they have power to say, you are worthy, you are not worthy in this social condition. And they want that power, and they don't want to let go of that power. There's an example for us in John's gospel about that. When Jesus heals a man who was born blind from birth, the Pharisees and the the 
rulers of the synagogue call him in to question him. And he doesn't know who it is that healed him or why he was healed, just that he was healed. And the Pharisees and the scribes want to know. And then this is an example of the power. And I'm just going to read this here. His parents answered their questioning and they said, We know this is our son and he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know. Who opened his eyes? We do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. This is the important verse of their power, the Pharisees. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. People observed and followed the laws of the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests because they were afraid to be excluded, to be persecuted, to not be part of their social interaction. And see, the Pharisees and the scribes, we know, started making their own laws, their own reasons, because God dealt with them, the, the, the Levites, the son of Levi, in Jeremiah's um, book, the book of Jeremiah. And from that, Jeremiah seven twenty four, they did not obey or incline their ear. This is the priests, the priestly line. But they walked in their own counsels and the stubbornness of their evil heart. Chapter 16, you too have done evil, the priests and the Levites, even more than your forefathers. For behold, you are each one walking according to the stubbornness of his own evil heart without listening to me. This is a heart that's opposed to God. They should have been celebrating God, embracing God, but instead they are making rules and laws that were opposed to God and putting them on the people and making the people follow them. See, in this portion of chapter 7, Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees differently than he interacts with the disciples and the other Jewish people and even the Gentiles. We need to look at his conversations, not only as confrontation of them, but also as refinement. Because if we remember throughout the Bible, God tells us what he's doing, what he's about, what he wants done. And from the prophet Malachi, there's, there's a prophecy about this. And it's Malachi 3.2, this, this one portion of it anyhow. It says, who can endure the day of his coming? Who's coming? The Lord's. And who can stand when he appears? And what that means is, who can stand up against his truth, his counsel, his ways? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. It says that Jesus' purpose is to come to refine people. So how does this apply to us? See, God is always about refining his priesthood. And we need not forget, or we should not forget, that we are called, you and I, this body, we are called a royal priesthood. First Peter chapter 2 says this about us. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's the call for all of us. We are supposed to proclaim his excellencies to everyone. We've been commissioned it also says that we are to reconcile the world to God. That's another commissioning for us. Just as it was for the, the Pharisees and the scribes, for the sons of Levi. So when we see the confrontation, we want to jump on, oh, he's condemning them. Yes, but, but more so, he wants to refine them. He doesn't want to see anybody cast out or cast down or cast aside. God loves us all and he wants to see the change in us all. So let's remember that as we read. The next section of Mark's gospel, verses 9 through 16, we can look at as the refining of the heart. So Jesus, he was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandments of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, 
If a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is korban, that is, given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. Now here comes a plain explanation here. And he, Jesus, called the crowd to him again and began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. So this is plain. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. God has always had a plan for Jesus. It's to save his creation from the separation that we, through Adam and Eve, chose. We choose whether we're close to God or separate from God. God doesn't pull himself away from us. It's what we do. In the Old Testament, he wanted the Levites to be his priestly line, to share the knowledge of God with the world. They were supposed to be separate from the other tribes, not taking possessions or being concerned with wealth or power. Unfortunately, they weren't able to walk out this plan. So God told the people through the prophets what was to happen, and he had a plan for the Levites. And this goes back to the Malachi. See, in Malachi 3.1, it's about John the Baptist out in the wilderness calling, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight his paths. In verse 1, it also talks about he, God, coming into his temple. What's his temple? It's the body. It's saying that God is physically going to come to earth. And why? Back to that verse 2. So that he can be like the refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap. Verse 3 of 3 Malachi. He will sit as a smelter and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. That was God's plans for the Levites, for the scribes, the Pharisees, the priests. He wanted to refine them so they could again be pleasing to the Lord. Now how, how could they be righteous? It's not in themselves. How are we righteous? Not in ourselves. It's by believing that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, that he has washed us in his blood, that we are seen as clean and acceptable. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. That's what God wanted for them, and that's what he wants for us too. And this is nothing new, because if we take a minute and, and think about the first time this happened, this first encounter, it's out of Luke's gospel, chapter 2. When Jesus was 12, they went to Jerusalem for the festival. And when his parents left, they thought Jesus was with them, but he wasn't. He was back at the temple. He was with the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests, and he was asking them questions and talking with them. And they were amazed at his knowledge. I'll just read it. And all who heard him, Jesus, were amazed at his understanding and his answers. See, Jesus, even at the age of 12, was there trying to refine the priests and the sons of Levi to get them to be doing what they were supposed to do from the very beginning. See, God wants to change lives. And how you change lives is when you change hearts. And the condition of the heart is important. In the Bible, the heart is mentioned over, you know, it's mentioned 644 times. Over 500 of those verses is about the very condition of the heart. The heart being wicked, the heart being broken, the heart being joyful. It's about the condition of the heart. It's very important back then and today. In Deuteronomy, when they laid down the law, the condition of the heart was mentioned 43 times. So when we talk about God's law, it's about a heart condition. In the book of Proverbs, a book of wisdom, it's mentioned 64 times in that book about the condition of your heart. It's so important. Here are just a few verses that pop out from Proverbs. Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. 
Proverbs 16.23, the heart of the wise instructs his mouth and adds persuasiveness to the lips. Now think about that for a minute. The heart instructs the mouth. Proverbs 15.28, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil things. See, Proverbs 18 says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So what's on your tongue reflects what's in your heart. Because it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. That's Matthew 12, 34. So the condition of our heart is important. The next section in chapter 7 can be looked at as the hardened heart. What's interesting is this is about the disciples. Verse 17, when he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, are you so lacking in understanding also? This is a comparison between the disciples and the Pharisees. See, in chapter 6 of Mark's gospel, it says this about the disciples. When Jesus got in the boat with them, the wind had stopped and they were utterly astonished. For they had not gained any insight from the incidents of loaves, but their heart was hardened. Chapter 6 tells us the disciples' hearts were hardened. And here in chapter 7, he's comparing the disciples with the Pharisees. Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from the outside cannot defile him, because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and is eliminated? Thus, Jesus declared all foods clean. That happened in Mark's gospel, but wasn't realized until the book of Acts when Peter had the vision. Verse 20, and he, Jesus, was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. See, the actions that people have start in their heart. It's a condition of the heart, and Jesus ministered this a little differently and a little more clearly in Matthew's gospel. Matthew 5, 21 says this, You have heard the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Guilty of what? Murder. Matthew 5, 27, you have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It's out of the heart that flow the issues of life. It's out of the heart that either good or evil things proceed. It's out of the heart. See, this is not a new thought or principle for the Jewish people, in this case, the disciples. Because from the Torah and from the Proverbs, which we talked about just a few moments ago, the conditions of the heart and warnings about hardening of the heart have been known to them. It was something they were to be mindful of. And as God's chosen people now, it's something for us to be mindful of too. See, that list of things, they, they sound like, actions or, or activities but they're all conceived thoughts Deuteronomy talks about hardening of the heart the Old Testament out of chapter 15 it says if there is a poor man among you one of your brothers any of you any of your towns and your lands which the Lord your God is giving to you you shall not harden your heart it's a warning here nor close your hand from your poor brother. Deuteronomy, back in the Old Testament, says that we are the ones that harden our hearts. Deuteronomy 15.9 says this, Beware that there is no base thought in your heart. It's 
It's our thoughts that come from our heart that cause our actions to come forth, causes our mouth to speak things that are opposed to God or against God. See, the hardening of the heart can come in several ways. In the book of Exodus, it tells us how God hardened intentionally Pharaoh's heart in order to display the greatness of God's power. Deuteronomy warns us that we can harden our own hearts. There are many other scriptures that talk about the influence around us that can harden our hearts. And in chapter 6 of Mark's gospel, it says the disciples' hearts were hardened. Think about that. Men who have witnessed miracles. They have seen people healed, demons cast out, weather altered, laws of physics undone, the dead brought back to life. And on top of that, they had miracles performed by their own hands, by the authority that Jesus shared with them. And yet, their hearts still were hardened. See, David knew about the condition of the heart. In Psalms, he cried out that God would create in him a clean heart, a heart that was pure from the evil thoughts and desires of his actions and activities. So we can ask ourselves, what hardens our heart? Disappointment, distraction, denying God, God's power, or maybe just even forgetfulness. Forgetfulness of what God has revealed to us as to who he is. Forgetfulness of what God has taught us in the Bible. So then what strengthens our heart? Remembrance of God's goodness, remembering God's faithfulness, reading your scriptures, believing them. Hearing the testimonies of other people can strengthen your heart to believe for God's goodness and sharing the testimonies that God has given you. Each one of us in this room have, the tes have testimonies of God's goodness. It's important for us to share that with other people. Because when we share it with other people, guess what? We also remind ourselves. Now, there was a time in my life where I had a hardened heart. It was after becoming saved. I went from 215 pounds down to 155 pounds. I had celiac disease, celiac disease. Anytime I ate anything with gluten, it felt like someone stubbed, stabbed a knife in my stomach. The pain lasted for four to six hours. For the next three to four days, the effects of that gluten had on my body. Weakness, um, discomfort, lots of discomfort. And I lived with that for three years. I was a believer in Jesus. I came to know the Lord in this time. And he had changed my life. He gave me a new heart. See, when I was an unbeliever, my heart was very cold, very hard. Not tender at all. I was very um, wicked and evil. A lot of you probably wouldn't want to know me. Or I wouldn't want to know of me. But see, God created in me a new heart, made me a new creation. I received Jesus and believed Jesus. But you know what? I read my Bible and I hardened my heart. Because I told people that God gave me celiac disease. I told people, and this was my testimony to them. I said, God gave me celiac disease as a daily reminder of what I put in my body could kill me. What I put in my mind and my heart could kill me as well. And for three years, that was my testimony. See, I had a belief that was opposed to God. And I shared that with people. And the people around me embraced that. So I was like a Pharisee putting something on people that they didn't need. And they embraced it. They celebrated it. Because my heart was hard to the aspect of God's healing. It took someone from another church long distance away to share with me that what I was doing was wrong, to confront me, to refine me, 
as Jesus was refining the Pharisees. Now, it took several months of reading scriptures and studying about healing and believing that healing was real before I got prayed for. And when I got prayed for, I felt something reach into my back and get pulled out. And while I was being prayed for, they said, you've been healed. I said, well, I don't know if I've been healed or not. Because I, I wasn't quite ready to believe. My heart was still a little bit hard. I said, something happened, but I wasn't sure. And the question was put to me, well, how will you know you've been healed? I said, well, when the craving for a glazed chocolate glazed donut so great, then I'll know I'm healed. Because for three years, I couldn't eat it. It's too painful. The repercussions were too great. I couldn't do it. It took almost three months of me believing in God's word, reading my Bible, before it became real. One Friday morning, after leaving a Bible study, I'm driving down the street, and there's Winchell's Donuts, and I said, today's the day. And I pulled in and ordered the chocolate glazed donut. Now, when I went in, the guy who owned the building, who owned the business, he, uh, he employed my cousin, or no, my cousin, my niece. And she, she told him all about me, and he knew that I couldn't have donuts. And so I went in and said, I want a chocolate glazed donut. He said, mm, I can't give it to you. I said, no, I want the chocolate glazed donut. He's like, no, I can't sell it to you. I said, listen to me, I want the chocolate glazed donut. And reluctantly, he said, that's fine, but I don't want to hear about what happens. Well, I ate that chocolate glazed donut and watched my watch. And 20 minutes passed, I felt great. An hour passed, I felt great. The rest of the day passed, I felt great. Man, I was healed. Chocolate glazed donut. See, I had made a law unto myself that was opposed to God. I hardened my heart toward the promise and the provision of God. And that's something that all of us can fall into without even knowing. See, I worshiped God. I went to church every Sunday, Bible studies, um, singles ministries. I praised God, loved God. But there was still part of my life that needed refining. And that's what Jesus is doing to the scribes and the Pharisees and to the disciples as well. The next section here in, in Mark's chapter 7, Mark's gospel, we could call it the believing expectant heart. And this is a great little story. 724 through 30. Jesus got up and went away from there to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know. Yet he could not escape notice. I wonder why that is. Testimonies. But after hearing of him, testimony... A woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at Jesus' feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of the Syrophoenician race, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, Let the little children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord. But even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, Because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back to her home, she found the child laying on the bed, the demon having left. See, Jesus never even had to go to her house like he did Jairus's. What do we know about this? We know that this woman lived amongst the Jews so much so that she knew her place in the social standing. Jesus called her a dog, and she did not confront him about that or rebuke that. She accepted that because of the teaching that the Jewish people put down, that they were God's chosen people. They were above everyone else. So we know that she knew this about them and about herself. But this is not the way it was supposed to be. See, in Leviticus 19, it says this about that, this type of person. When a stranger resides in your land, you shall do him no wrong. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you are aliens, 
in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. There shall be one standard for you, and it shall be for the stranger as well as the native. For I am the Lord your God. See, she would have known this. She would have known that the promises for the Jewish people were for her as well. She lived among them. And she called it out. There's another similar story of this type of faith from Luke's gospel. And if you remember it, it's the centurion who had the slave. And this is what he said to Jesus. For I am also a man placed under authority with soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and another one, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and turned and said to the crowd, that was following me. I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. See, Jesus healed the centurion's servant without having to go. Jesus cast the demon out of this woman without having to go. Why? Because she had a believing heart, a heart of expectation. She knew the promises of God. She heard the testimonies. She knew that God saw her as equal to the Jewish people. And it is such great faith. Now lastly, this brings us to the last part of chapter 7. And this is, again, a believing, expectant heart. But this is different. This believes that all things are possible. Verse 31. And again... He, Jesus, went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis, the ten Greek cities, remember? They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hands on him. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, he touched the tongue with the saliva. And he looked up to heaven, and with a deep sigh, he said to him, Apophatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began to speak plainly. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more, they widely, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, He has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. These men heard the testimonies, most likely, of the demon-possessed man who went back to the region of the Decapolis to share all that he had done. These men knew that Jesus was able to cast out the demons and to heal or to to set free another man. They didn't know what was going to happen when they brought their friend, but they knew something was going to happen. They didn't know why he couldn't hear or speak, but what they knew they got from a testimony. They were not reading the Old Testament. They were not reading the prophets. They were not being ministered to by the scribes and the Pharisees. They were Greeks, raising pigs, eating pigs. No self-respecting Jew would have anything to do with this area or this region. This is an example of a heart that believes all things are possible. What's interesting is Jesus didn't deny these men. The Syrophoenician woman, he said, let the children eat first. But these men, they just said, come on. He didn't deny them. He didn't teach them anything new. He didn't confront them. He just said, don't tell. Why would he say don't tell? Well, this is opposite of what he said in the chapter 1 
when he healed the leper. The leper, remember, he told to go and to, to witness before the priests. Don't tell. Because he knew that the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders, were looking for reasons to persecute him. Sharing God's blessing with the Gentiles would have been abhorrent to them. Do you know what? They share their testimony anyway. They continued to proclaim God's goodness to the people around, us, around them. So what does this mean for us? This chapter 7 of Mark's Gospel about the heart. Well, I think we need to remember what God has said about us. Each one of us who believes in Jesus, we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. We are part of his family. We are a royal priesthood. And as a royal priesthood, we have a, a calling on our lives, a purpose. We are to minister God's goodness to the world around us. How do we do that? We are to share the testimonies of what God has done for us and for those that we know. We are to remember those testimonies and how we receive them. We are to teach and to preach His word, to proclaim His promises and His truth. Just as the disciples did with authority, because it's true. We are to watch over our own hearts so as not to be like the religious, the Israelites that turned away from God to follow the own dictates of their heart. We are to believe without doubting. And when we believe, we are to believe that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. It's not our own power. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts and our lives. See, we are to be the image of Christ Jesus, from glory to glory, being transformed. And this is the importance of chapter 7 of Mark's Gospel. So let's close our eyes, take a minute to reflect. I'm going to close in prayer. Oh, you don't need to play. That's fine. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the truth and the power of your word. We thank you that you desire us to be like your son, Jesus. We thank you that the things in our heart that might be opposed to you or that might be hardened to your ways, you desire to refine. Not to condemn us, but to refine us so that we would walk in the righteousness that you've given us. That righteousness comes through Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost is what you've promised us. You've delivered that righteousness through your Son, the washing of our hearts, so that we may have the peace that only you provide, Lord. The peace that surpasses all understanding, the peace that in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of pain, we can feel your comfort and your love and share that with those around us so that we too can be a joyous people rejoicing at all times being thankful in all situations and circumstances Father we thank you for this gift that you've given us help us Lord to build our testimonies to remember our testimonies to write them down, to share them, to strengthen our hearts with them so that we can be as you desire us to be, more and more like Jesus. Amen.
Thank you. With that, I guess you may be dismissed.